Hello everyone, whenever you hear about the term Xbox exclusive, you'd probably immediately think that it represents anything but quality or something that is memorable and enjoyable for years and years to come. And I'm not going to beat around the bush and talk about Xbox's first party state and how it's been a whole roller coaster from games. They have been fantastic, from Forza Horizon 5 and Hi Fi Rush to games like Redfall. That's been done to death and I've talked about it before on my channel, but what I really do want to talk about in this video are the exclusives that Xbox had once championed as the future of its console, only for those games to be forgotten by a lot of people. Just like how NFTs came and went, Nintendo and Sony have so many games from the last generation of consoles that have been so revered by just about everyone like Super Mario Odyssey, Zelda Breath of the Wild, Super Smash Bros Ultimate, Spider-Man, God of War, you name it. These games are so firmly ingrained within the minds of a lot of people. Xbox during last gen had of course Halo, Gears and Forza, but we're not going to focus on that. I'm going to dust off my Xbox Series S that's probably not had any use in a long time and look at some of the exclusive titles that are overlooked and underappreciated even to this day. So buck up, we're going in for a nice little ride. Also subscribe to the channel with notifications on, it's really appreciated. Quantum Break released in 2016 as one of the last few first party titles that were greenlit by the previous Xbox leadership to headline the Xbox One in its first few years. Remedy by then had already built up a reputation for delivering deep, story driven titles from the Max Payne games to its most recent game at the time, Alan Wake and its American Nightmare spin off. Xbox at the same time, they were looking to build their presence in entertainment. They made the 360 as more than just a gaming console, to the point of positioning themselves as their best console for entertainment, and they based their entire pitch for the Xbox One as an all in one console. Well, I can only wonder how that turned out. TV, 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 Xbox, go home. That didn't stop Remedy, however, as they set out to create not only a game with a deep, story-rich experience, but one where they could integrate the game world with a live-action experience. And I feel that they've largely succeeded at that for the most part. Quantum Break's story takes place in a fictional city called Riverport. The main protagonist, Jack Joyce, returns to the city after staying away for six years in Thailand to meet his best friend, Paul Serene, where he is working on a time machine and expanding on the work that was first initiated by Jack's brother, Will. After an accident occurs within the time machine, leading to a fracture in time, Jack receives chrodon based powers as is his older version of his friend, except that he and his company are hunting him down and are labelling him as a terrorist. So that's the gist of the story and it's a great one at that. You feel that sense of urgency in stopping the end of time, but at the same time you're fighting your way through the clutches of someone who you once appreciated as a friend, who would have your back even at the darkest of times. Every twist you encounter in Quantum Break compels you to keep playing, and I certainly felt that way, knowing that the story's pacing felt very consistent throughout from start to finish. Perhaps one of the biggest aspects of the game that I loved the most were the narrative choices made by the game's antagonist, Paul Serene. You briefly control him in between the mainline acts of the game putting you in his shoes and deciding what to do with some of the major characters in the game, knowing firmly that his decisions weigh a heavy price on their fate and his own too. The decisions you make feel significant and play a heavy role within the story, but considering the game's linear path, I feel that some of these decisions you could make could have been better emphasised as the game progresses. Not only that, after you have made the choice, Quantum Break also makes use of some pretty handy online functions where you learn how much of the Xbox community has agreed with your choices, alongside learning about the choices that your friends have made. And the decisions themselves will override in your most recent playthroughs as well, showing that there is some replay value to be enjoyed within Quantum Break. Finally, there are also the live action elements of the game, which focus on the decisions that you make as Serene, and its overwhelming effects on the company that he runs, Monarch Solutions. I enjoyed watching these four live action episodes, feeling that there was a good impression for the characters to develop over time, alongside seeing how Serene's character influences the events of the game, given that his own circumstances have a part to play with this. 
there's one thing I do not like about these episodes. When I was about to start them for the very first time, it kept on not loading the episode to stream, forcing me to opt to download them, and they're a whopping 75GB download on Xbox, which isn't ideal, but not entirely a deal breaker. The gameplay itself is just as fun as wanting to experience how the story unfolds as you continue to play along. Quantum Break is a third person shooter, with time altering abilities added to the mix. You can automatically get to cover, but it's not particularly helpful especially when you're trying to manoeuvre your way through out of a group of enemies. Enemy variety is okay to say the least, you have your usual one at grunts, alongside enemies with anti chronon radiation suits, and grunts who require a lot more than just firepower to take down. It's not bad by any means, but yes, it could have been a bit better. Perhaps by far the best aspect of the gameplay are the time of altering abilities that you receive. After the Chronon Time Machine accident, one of the first abilities you receive is Time Vision, which allows you to detect enemies, collectibles, and ways to reverse time in order to, prog to progress through the game. One fantastic aspect of Time Vision is its involvement in allowing you to destroy objects, then rewind time so that you can sort out the obstacles in your way, which is really awesome. Time Stop is more on the offensive aspect of the time powers you receive in Quantum Break. You can stop time and any bullets that you fire at an enemy, they will instantly die once the effect is worn off. It's one of the better mechanics that you can really make use of early on in the game. Time Shield helps you to defend against bullets, whilst Time Dodge is a defensive ability designed to help you dodge against enemies. Although as you progress throughout the game, you unlock Time Blast. It's one of the more powerful time powers that you can unlock that allows you to channel a more powerful blast of chronon energy killing any soldier that stands in your way, and by far the best ability is Time Rush. You can stop time and run for a short period of time, whilst also being able to defeat soldiers with a melee takedown. It's a lifesaver, particularly in the case of boss battles where you need a lot of firepower and your time powers really do prevail in these situations. The upgrade system is okay, though I feel that having to find collectible chronon just to upgrade your powers feels a bit tedious at times. But all in all, the gameplay is just as enthralling and compelling as it can be. Visually, this is one of the best looking Xbox exclusives that were released last generation. Remedy went all out to making sure that every ounce of the Xbox One's power was used to craft some truly fine details with the character models, environments and exploration of the game world. It still holds up extremely well to this day, and whilst there was some controversy at the time over the game running at 720p, I feel that it's, it's not a problem whatsoever, it still looks stunning and, and eye-opening. There was a patch that enabled 4K support to make Quantum Break look better than ever, but I don't have an Xbox Series X yet, so I really can't say much. Quantum Break clearly deserved so much more attention than what it deserved when it was released in 2016. Yes, it sold relatively well and it was one of the better Xbox exclusives, but I don't hear many people talking about this game. This has been truly stepped upon over the years and it's such a shame to see it go this way. The story is gripping and well written, the performances are great, the gameplay and time power mechanics are superb, and it is still a lovely looking game regardless of which Xbox console you're playing on. If you have a Game Pass subscription or have some spare change to spend on, go in to play Quantum Break, it's a brilliant experience that deserves far more attention than you think. The next game I'm covering in this list is Sunset Overdrive. This game proved to be somewhat controversial when it was revealed at Xbox's E3 conference in 2013, mostly because Insomniac Games developed this game and they're far more well known on the PlayStation side. They worked on Spyro the Dragon, Ratchet and Clank and for most of the PS3 era, Resistance. So it was a bit of a shock to a lot of people that they were working on Sunset Overdrive one of the big exclusives to sell people on an Xbox One at the time. Nevertheless, this doesn't matter because Insomniac developed on the game that's not only fantastic, it's one that has been slept on as well by Longshot. And like with Quantum Break, I had a fantastic time with this game from start to finish. The premise of Sunset Overdrive is relatively simple and it's not a game that relies upon its story to really keep you having fun. You're working at some dead-end job collecting trash for a conglomerate called Fizzco, celebrating the launch of their new overcharged drink. What happens next? Because Fizzco skipped through rigorous government testing in the pursuit of profits, 
Sunset City descends into chaos as people end up mutating into monstrosities we call OD or overcharged drinkers. I guess they had a Tulsa overdose, right? Afterwards, you hold up in some small apartment until you meet Walter, who is convinced that Fisco is trying to cover up for their misdeeds. As you progress through the story, you meet multiple factions, from the Bushido troops to a bunch of students reeling from the post-apocalyptic disaster that is Sunset City. You also meet a bunch of LARPers running the Kingdom of Fargathia, who can't tell the difference between fiction and reality. That's for another time, but you know what I mean, right? Each of these groups are trying to find answers on why Sunset City is swarming with OD, and not to mention a group of criminals called Scabs are making life harder for these lot. The story is relatively simple to understand, but there are moments where it falls flat. The character development with some of these groups that you ally with, it doesn't really seem to expand enough to the point where you really feel a true connection, especially towards the end of the game, and not to mention, Sunset Overdrive's mission design doesn't really allow that to thrive. Where it does falter in the story, Sunset Overdrive shines in its humour. It hits a spot especially with internet and pop culture jokes as you're playing along, and it doesn't take itself too seriously either. Is attacking me. This goes marketing is getting really aggressive. Hey, you know what sounds like fun? If you stop moving for a second. Where Sunset Overdrive truly shines as a game, it's easy its gameplay. The traversal is utterly sublime and an essential part to succeeding in this game. It emphasises the need to bounce and grind. Now what is that you might ask? Bounce involves jumping over air vents, cars, tents, you name it. You're jumping across to avoid hitting the ground and to keep that streak of constantly moving and strafing around the game world. And this connects to grind where you're moving across rails, electric wires and train tracks to counter that fast rapid movement of OD who are desperate for that sweet sweet overcharge. The constant need to move around with these two mechanics makes for a fantastic experience. You're on the move to kill anything standing in your way. The more you bounce and grind, the bigger your star meter grows. The traversal and exploration of the game world was so good that I did not need to even use fast travel. It felt fast for me from my experience to move around to where I needed to go. The gunplay is also great with a ton of unique weapons that you can use. I personally loved using the flaming compensator for killing and burning tons of OD and scabs, the TNTeddy for burning down swarms of enemies even when you're cornered, and towards the end of the game I opted to unlock the shocker to put down the Fisco bots. Like I mentioned before, I just didn't like how the mission design felt in Sunset Overdrive. You're usually doing a bunch of errands and fetch quests, like trying to find items to appease a bunch of college students to trying to burn pigeons to heal the Larpsus King. It gets very monotonous as you continue to play through, but if you turn your brain off and focus on the traversal and combat, you're in for a very fun experience. The music is also a banger, the rock undertones just felt so good to listen to as well, and for an early Xbox One game it still holds up incredibly well. The visuals still look great and the light-hearted over-the-top art style that Sunset Overdrive went for perfectly illustrates this as well. And this is yet another Xbox exclusive that was completely slept on. I'm still unbelievably blown away by the visual design, how fast and frenetic the gameplay is, and how it doesn't take itself too seriously with its fourth world breaking humour. Sunset Overdrive, much like Quantum Break as I mentioned before, is a game that deserved a lot more attention than it received back then. If you're wanting a game that's giving you a whole sandbox to beat the shit out of enemies whilst relishing in the amazing traversal that keeps you moving, Sunset Overdrive is perfect. So here's the last game that I'm covering for this video. Vice of Rome is a game that I just don't really feel as fond of as the other two games that I've talked about in this video. It's also a unique game that it served as one of the marquee launch titles for the Xbox One nearly 10 years ago, with the goal of showcasing the system's visual capabilities alongside demonstrating the added features with the Kinect 2.0 sensor. And this game was supposed to be released as a Kinect only game during the twilight years of the Xbox 360 era. But during development, Crytek, who are best known for, for making the Crisis games, they opted to cut down on the game's reliance on the Kinect, so it's only really useful for voice commands like firing a volley. Needless to say, I don't own the Kinect, and the serious consoles have cut support entirely, so 
it, it's not surprising given how catastrophic it was for Microsoft to place such so much importance on a device that didn't even work well with the controls of core games. Rice is overlooked, but not like Quantum Break and Sunset Overdrive, where those games offered something unique, something that justifies a drive to keep on playing. It was a deeply disappointing experience through and through, and by the second and third acts, I was contemplating dropping the game entirely. Before I get to the issues with the game, I will explain about what I do think that this game really shines on. The visuals are undoubtedly the best part of Rise by far. Crytek has a history of pushing consoles and PCs to the limits with their games. There is a reason why the phrase, can it run Crisis exists to this very day, and the third entry in that series also pushed the then current gen consoles at the time, the PS3 and the Xbox 360 to the absolute limits. PCs are still pushed really hard by the technology offered by not only Crytek's games, but the Cry engine as a whole. Rice looks immensely striking. The environments look, feel carefully crafted. You can see the detail in some of Rome's buildings in the second chapter, to how gritty and brutal the battles in the beaches are. The character models feel equally as impressive, especially with the use of subsurface scattering to illustrate that level of realism that the developers have grown for with Rice. It's certainly a title that holds up visually to this day, which is even more mind blown when you consider that this was an Xbox One launch title. But that's the only redeeming factor that I can say about Rice. Visuals are nice, but if your core gameplay isn't tough to snuff, then Houston, we have a problem. The combat system for Rice is, how can I put it? Pretty atrocious. Most of your time can be spent fighting barbarians with the gameplay that is a little bit similar to the likes of Assassin's Creed or the Arkham Trilogy. The enemy variety has been lacking so much, judging from what I've played, considering that you're fighting against the same few barbarians in almost every combat sequence. There's your standard barbarian and the brutes which require a couple more hits to overcome. Normally you're pressing X and Y to attack and then B to dodge and A to deflect and parry attacks. Once you've weakened these barbarians, a skull icon appears on the top of their heads, meaning you can press RT to execute them brutally, depending on the colour scheme that the game is telling you to follow if anything. So the quicker you follow the quick time events, you either get more health, XP, focus or damage boosts depending on which ward you have set with the d-pad. At times you will get commands to fire a volley or a catapult with either LB or shouting through your connect as I've mentioned before. The biggest problem that I have with Rice is that the combat just doesn't provide as much depth in regards to what you could really do in game. You're just repetitively hacking and killing as many barbarians as possible with many of the combat sequences being extremely lacking in how unique they are. The executions look cool, but their impact just feels diminished when you have to press RT a lot of the time to just finish enemies off. The exploration seemed pretty limited as well, so the ability to explore parts of the game world comes across as feeling restricted. It's a missed opportunity given the game's premise and the story, which I didn't think was bad enough looking back. You're a Roman general called Marius Titus, who is telling his story about how he rose up the ranks of the Roman army after seeing his family being slaughtered by barbarians. Rice's premise is interesting and there are some good ideas that are very much masked by some of the most underdeveloped combat systems that I've ever seen in the game by far, considering that this is what you'll be doing for most of your time in the game. The visuals are stunning and still look amazing to this day, even as an Xbox One launch title, and the integration with Kinect didn't really seem too half bad, but considering how Microsoft has tried super hard to wash the bad taste of its motion sensing device, it's not really needed. I just can't help but feel that out of the Xbox exclusives I played and showcased in this video, it's easily the least fleshed out and designed by far. To finish off this video, it's just insane how many Xbox exclusives have been either slept on or just completely unappreciated from the get-go. I think there's a lot more exclusives that I could have talked about, like Grounded, Bleeding Edge, Scream Ride and a couple more, but these games that I've talked about in length are mostly great when you really think about it. Maybe for other games within the Xbox lineup, I could expand on this with another video in the future, but these three games have opened my eyes to how much Xbox has been stepped on over the last couple of years. What Xbox exclusives do you feel were overlooked nowadays? 
feel free to leave some suggestions in the comment section if you want to. And thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, comment or even subscribe to the channel. It's really appreciated. And also feel free to follow me on Twitter or join my Discord server. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.